You have no right to be ordinary. God has called you to be extraordinary. Good morning, Liberty. How you doing today? Come on, stand to your feet. We're going to worship Jesus for all he is and all he's done. How many of you believe he's faithful today? Amen? Yeah. Sing this with me. I am holding on to faith Cause I know you make a way I don't always understand And I don't always get to see but I will believe it, I will believe it, saying, you may mountains move, you may giants fall, and you use songs of praise to shape prison walls, and I will speak to my fear, and I will preach to my doubt that you were vain.
Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. And all praise will rise to Christ our King.
Are you guys grateful today that our Christ, our Lord and Savior, that he has risen from the grave, that he is alive today? That in these moments that we gather today in a world that has gone nuts, that we can know that our God is sitting on the throne and he is ever making intercession for you and me. Let me tell you what that means. That means that Jesus today is praying for you. It doesn't matter what you're going through and it doesn't matter how difficult today might seem. Jesus is praying for you. When life seems to be falling apart, when hearts seem to be broken, when challenges seem to be like too insurmountable, Jesus is praying for you. And so I just hope that today, whatever you brought into this room, and I know there's a lot of stuff that was brought into this room, my prayer for each and every one of you is that you would grab a hold of that truth, that you are never alone, that Jesus is with you every step of the way, and no matter what today might hold, God has your back. Aren't you grateful for that today? Hey, let's pray together if we could. Father, today we thank you for the opportunity that we have to once again come together and to worship. Lord, just to lift our hearts and our voices, just to thank you for who you are. God, to thank you for your goodness and to thank you for your mercy and for your grace because we need it. Every person who is gathered in this room, every person watching right now, wherever they might be, Lord, all of us are sinners who've messed up, blown it time and time again. And God, we're so grateful that you love us anyway. We're so grateful that today when, when we're walking through a storm, Father, that Jesus is there and he is right at your side and he is talking about us to you. And God, we're grateful for that. God, we're grateful that you loved us, that you gave your son, Jesus that he came to this earth and he died on the cross for our sins, was buried and and rose again three days later. And because we believe in him, because we come to that moment where we say, yes, I'm a sinner and yes, I need a savior. And Jesus is the one who saves that when we make that declaration, Father, we thank you that you not only save us for now, but you save us forever. And God, we give you the praise for it. Lord, bless our time together today. We pray that you would be honored and you be lifted up. Only you, no other person, no other idea, just you, that it's all about you. And God, we pray this prayer in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Hey, guys, go ahead and have a seat. Before we kind of move into the rest of our morning together in celebration, I just want to like point out a, a special group of faculty members that are here with us today. Right over here on my left, your right, is Troy Temple, who's the dean of the School of Divinity and one of our campus pastors. Troy, stand up if you would. There's Troy. But now while Troy is the dean of the School of Divinity, one of our campus pastors does a great job. Uh, what I also, what are you doing over there? You're bowing down. That's, what, stop it. And what I do know is that as awesome as he is, what is more awesome is the fact that all of the School of Divinity faculty is right up here in the box just to my right and your left. And so we just want to know, let you know we appreciate each and every one of you and the work that you do in training up our church leaders for the next generation. Hey, today, and we'll introduce him in just a moment, but you know we've got a great speaker here today. But before we kind of jump into that, we also have with us today one of our staff members here at Liberty, Stacy Rhodes, who is the director of the Center for Financial Literacy. And you know, today we're going to talk about like the importance of like getting your money right. Jesus talked about money a lot in the New Testament. It's an important topic. It's not something that is taboo. It's not something that we should ignore. And so Stacy's going to come just for a couple of minutes and to share with you some resources that are free, that are available to each and every one of you to help you like get started in this thing called life in the right way. And so, Stacy, if you would just take a moment, share that with us. That's right. Thank you so much, Pastor Jonathan. We're so excited to be here today and to have Dave Ramsey with us. And we are praying, yes, we're praying that you guys have your ears open because it's never too early to start thinking about your financial freedom. He has been coaching people into freedom. And the conversation starts today, but it doesn't end today. At the Center for Financial Literacy, we exist. Our passion is to work with students, faculty, on staff, and staff on how to use money as a tool in a wise and God-honoring way. And we do that in several different ways. So the first and probably the most impactful thing you can do is sit down with one of our peer financial coaches. 
And these coaches are trained to work with you one-on-one -on -one to talk through your money questions and your money situation. If you have questions about student debt or investments or um, anything, anything finance related, we are here to answer those questions and apply it to your situation. There is no dumb question. We want to help you. The other thing that we offer are free personal finance courses. Maybe you don't want to talk to anyone just yet, but you want to work through the concepts and you want to create your own plan. We have a personal course that walks you from A to Z of creating your own personal plan. And then we also have accessible content. We have an Instagram that gives financial tips every single day. We also have tools and resources on our website that are completely free to you guys. So there, please, please, please act now. Don't wait. Time is money and we're just here to help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacy. Appreciate all that you do. Hey guys, today, uh, 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found faithful. Stewardship is an important part of our journey. It's an important part of the Christian life. And that is what our speaker today has spent his life focusing on. And so we're thrilled to have him here today. But before I introduce him, I want to introduce his better half for sure, Sharon Ramsey, Dave's wife. Would you stand right over here to my left? Let's welcome her today. So Dave Ramsey's written a ton of books, five New York Times bestsellers. His radio show is right now on over 500 radio stations across the United States and Canada. Uh, people from all over the world have been changed. Their lives have been impacted as a result of his passion to simply do things right and according to God's Word, according to biblical principles and how we deal with money. And so it's, we're excited, man. We're thrilled. Uh, to have Dave Ramsey here with us today. So would you just let's give a big Liberty welcome to Dave Ramsey. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you. Thanks, guys. Oh, sweet. So a thousand years ago, I was speaking at this event in Memphis, Tennessee, at Bellevue Baptist, Six Flags Over Jesus, and um, Jonathan's dad was there, and he used this line, and I've always wanted to use this line here. So my friend Jonathan called me up the other day, true story, and he said, Dave, I know you're a great American. Do you believe in free speech? And I said, yes. And he said, I want you to give one. Jerry Falwell Sr. Jerry Falwell Sr. used that on Adrian Rogers in my presence. It was a lot of fun. Wow, very cool. Let's pray. God, you know I can do these talks by myself. They sure are better when you do them. Holy Spirit, we turn this time over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Belgian plow horse is a large, muscular, athletic horse, much like you would think of if you think of a Clydesdale. And they're built, they're bred to pull amazing amounts of weight. If you ever go out into the country in Virginia or Tennessee where I am, and they're having a tractor pull, they might also have a pull where they see how much an animal can pull, something like a, a mule or a horse. And you might see one of these big muscular horses, and they have these weight sleds that they hook to them and see how far they can pull them. And if, you, if they've got the tractor pull going, it's a souped up tractor that's super high horsepower. This is a super high horsepower horse. A Belgian plow horse, when hooked to one of those devices, can on its own pull around 6,000 pounds. If you were to hook two Belgian plow horses who have never met each other before that day, had never been trained together, 
had in no way had a relationship of any kind, hook them both in a harness together, you would think mathematically that if one can pull six, then two could pull 12. However, two can pull about 18. The power of unity, the power of synergy. If, however, you get what farmers would tell you is called a matched pair, two Belgian plow horses, possibly from the same line, lineage, possibly trained, or definitely trained together, possibly raised on the farm together, have a, a relationship, and they know how to work together. One can pull six, two untrained can pull 18, two that are a matched pair that are unified can pull 30,000 pounds. Five times what one can do. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, the psalmist said. We started our little company, Ramsey Solutions, many years ago, and we got it up to about 10 people, and I, I, I was a horrible boss. I was not even a leader. I didn't know what we were doing. I, I hired anybody that could fog up a mirror. Consequently, I had crazy people in the building. We had a toxic environment. People weren't working. They were showing up late. It was driving me crazy. I was so stupid when I started in business that I thought if you hired people that they would actually like work and stuff. <laughs> but not everybody's trained that way. Not everybody knows to do that. And so consequently, we had a lot of disunity in that organization. It's taken me many, many years and lots and lots of hard work to create a culture inside of our organization of unity, of oneness. Now there's 1,057 of us this week at Ramsey. We win best place to work every year. We have an un incredible culture. When you walk into the organization, the breath, the, the air smells like it does here on this campus where there's a sense of oneness, a sense of purpose, a sense of unity. How good and pleasant it is when we can work together. See, you thought I was going to talk about money, but I'm not. I want to talk to you about the power of unity. Because I have seen a thousand team members completely create not only a major national brand, but begin to change the world. This one little ragtag group of people, you folks are world changers. You will leave liberty and go out there and implement the things that you learn while you're here in organizations. And to the extent those organizations are unified is the extent they will be effective. Marriages who are not on the same page have incredible trouble raising good kids, have incredible trouble building wealth, have incredible trouble. One of the biggest calls on the Ramsey show, on my radio show is, Dave, how do I get my spouse to go along with the financial ideas, to get out of debt, to be on a budget together? How do I get my spouse on board? Number one call on the show. And when we did the largest study of millionaires ever done in North America two years ago, 10,167 of them studied, a theme kept popping up. 74% of them, which is statistically significant, 74% of the millionaires said one of the reasons they became millionaires is they were able to work together with their spouse. It turns out a matched pair can pull 30,000 pounds. The power of unity in your organization. A marriage is an organization, a family is an organization, a church is an organization, a university is an organization, Ramsey Solutions is an organization. And to the extent it's disunified, it's toxic. To the extent we're not working together. Now, I've studied this for 25 years as I've become a better leader and learning how to be a world-class leader, to have a company that size that has best place to work, that has a culture that everyone wants to work in. Christians move from all over the world to get to be on our team. And, and so I've studied this, and I'm like, I still cannot figure out what creates unity. But I've identified five things for sure that destroy it. And so, world changers, 
You and I have a job. We have to fight against these five enemies of unity within any organization that we're a part of, and you will be a part of a church, you will be a part of a university for the rest of your life, you'll be an alumni, you'll be a part of something, and any time you see one of these five enemies pop up, you know that organization is being toxic, it's being ineffective to the extent that you see these enemies of unity show up, and I fight against them every day, actively. The first enemy of unity is poor communication. Some organizations use mushroom communication. They keep everybody in the dark and feed them manure. And when you don't know what's going on, the neurological science says that is emotionally and chemically harder for your body and your psyche, your spirit, to accept than bad news. In other words, no news is a lot worse than bad news. I don't know what's going to happen is a lot worse of, I got a tough road ahead. So go ahead and just tell people what's going on. Y'all heard there was a pandemic last year, right? So we all, the Ramsey team is getting ready to go home because they're sending everybody home for quarantine and all this stuff. And so we're getting ready to shut the business down. Everybody's going to be working from home. And and so we're calling people in because our team is wanting to know what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen, what's going to happen. And and the only thing I told them for sure is whatever, I I don't know, because I've never led through a pandemic before. I don't know how to do this. This is my first one. So I, I don't know, but what I know, you'll know. And so I told them, this is how much cash we have left. When the revenues dip below the expenses, we'll start burning the cash. When the cash starts going away and gets really, really low, leadership team is first going to take no pay. After leadership team takes no pay for a while, if it continues to burn cash, and we, because we don't borrow money, y'all probably heard the rumor, you know, it's, you know, what are we going to do then? Well, guess what? Some of y'all are going to go without pay for a while. We'll do some furloughs. And, and if it continues for a long time, we're going to begin to let some of y'all go because we won't be able to pay you. But we'll tell you a long time before that happens. Good news, we were able to turn it, and we never even got into the cash. We actually, revenues went up. How weird is that? But we didn't know that. It was a highly stressful situation. A thousand people out there, a single mom sitting out there in our staff meeting is wondering if she's going to be able to feed our kids. She would rather have the real news, even if it's bad, than no news. Lots of companies around America were poorly led and just chose to tell people nothing. And you know what people assume if you tell them nothing? That things are much worse than they actually are. No one goes to the positive. Poor communication. The second enemy of unity is a lack of shared purpose. When you have an agreed upon purpose that this is what we're doing, that creates a level of unity. It's a battle we're going to fight. We're going to walk out of debt. We're going to work extra and get out, get the debt paid off. We're going to change jobs and change cities because this is the reason we're doing this. We are, we have a shared purpose purpose. When you're in an organization, you need a shared purpose. You need to have a a mission statement. You need to have things you're aiming at. Very, very clearly stated, this is the strategic goal. This is the desired future, as my friend Dr. Henry Cloud calls it, and this is what we're going to do to get to that desired future. And it's not anything else. It's that. And everyone knows what that is. When you're leading inside of an organization, and by the way, if you're in an organization, you're leading. You're leading in this university by the way you act, the way you walk, the way you talk when you're away from here and when you're on campus. Everyone is leading all the time. Some are just unaware. So when you're leading, make sure that the people that you're leading know exactly where we're going and exactly what the cost is to get there. They'll pay the cost if you tell them what it is. They just want to know. Lots of communication and a shared purpose. The Belgian plow horses have a unified shared purpose, and they get to lift five times together what one of them can lift by themselves. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. The the third enemy of, uh, of unity is probably the worst, gossip. 
And social media has made gossip an art form. Drive-by shootings on social media happen every day. You call it trolling. I call it juvenile delinquency. TikTok is completely out of control. Reddit has lost its mind. And Twitter is not far behind. Now, I'm not suggesting that you abandon all of those. I have uh, almost 3 million followers on Instagram, a million on Twitter, and I've not shut the account down, okay? I'm not shutting the account down, but I'll tell you what I am going to do with this dirty glass of water. I'm going to pour some clean in to displace the filth. And I'm going to think about when my natural tendency is to be a smart aleck, I'm going to think about that tweet before I send it. I used to not do that, and I've tweeted some things I wished I hadn't tweeted. You might have done that. You might have posted something you wished, oh, I hope they don't find that later when I'm interviewing for a job. You might have done that. But here's the thing. We have the unbelievable courage to tear down people from a distance anonymously, to destroy them anonymously. And, and, and you know, you have four followers. Nobody cared. <laughs> but you seem that you need to voice your negative opinion about someone. This, thing, this gossip thing is out of control. World changers, there are takers and there are givers. Hey, world changers, there are people who build and there are those that tear down. Well, some things need to be torn down. Yeah, well, that's not your job. It's not your job. Your job is you're a builder. You're a giver. You're a person who lifts things up. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm someone who adds value to the conversation, not creates the tear down. Oh, I'm going to tear it down. I'm an activist. No, you're just a glorified keyboard warrior. That's all you are. Can you tell I'm bitter? <laughs> hey, Eleanor Roosevelt said, small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, and great minds discuss ideas. Why don't we try posting some ideas that lift? Post some concepts. Let's talk to our friends. Let's talk in our friends group around the cooler. Not about what the silly so-and-so is doing that we've never met 5,000 miles away who probably has absolutely no impact on our life anyway, but everybody seems to have an opinion. Let's just lift ideas up instead of tear people down, world changers. This is how it works. See, if you can run gossip out of an organization, you can create unity. But when you're in, you work at a place and all they do is talk about each other, you know how that works, right? You know if you're in a friend group and all they do while you're together is all talk about each other, as soon as you walk out of the room, you know who they're talking about, right? I mean, I grew up in a family that you had to go to Thanksgiving dinner or you were the one they talked about because you weren't there. You know how that is. Who wants to hang out with people like that? That's just trashy. These aren't high-quality human beings. They're gossips. They're busybodies. So we're not adding value to the conversation when that's going on. So we actually have one of our 14 core values at Ramsey is no gossip, and we will fire you for gossiping. Can you imagine a company that does that? We'll fire you for gossiping. So here's your rule. You're going to have problems. I mean, there's 1,057 people in the building. That means there's 1,057 opportunities for you to be pissed off about something, right? <laughs> there's going to be frustration. There's going to be conflict when you have human beings around, right? And if there's not, you're probably not doing anything because if you move something, there's always friction. So just expect some conflict and some friction. That's not the issue. It's not when you have a problem inside our organization. It's, it, it's not if you have a problem. It's when what are you going to do? Well, you got one option in our organization. You have to talk to someone who can do something about it, meaning you hand your negatives to leadership and work with leadership to solve the negative situation. You don't go and talk to the lady at the front desk and say, well, you know, those guys in technology, they can't get my computer fixed and I can't make any sales and apparently leadership's a bunch of doofuses and I'll fire your butt for doing that. Dave Ramsey, 
Dave Ramsey, I, you know, we had one little character who went to a, a bar and told the whole bar that Dave Ramsey, his wife worked for us, and told the whole bar that Dave Ramsey was trying to kill his employees because we all went back to work and we fired her the next day. That's kind of harsh. Yeah, it's kind of harsh for him to stand in a bar and tell everybody in there, I'm trying to kill my employees when I give him money through his wife's work to feed his kids? See, this is a tear down. It's not a build up. So I don't want her in my organization because she just married really poorly. A perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. Number four, enemy of unity, unresolved disagreements. How many of you have ever disagreed with something an organization was doing that you were a part of, or disagreed with one of your friends or relatives? Raise your hand. How many of you didn't raise your hand have a problem with lying? We all have disagreements, and the Bible is really clear on what we do. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Second Hesitations does not say, post your disagreement on Twitter. I really think at Liberty University they ought to do so-and-so. Then maybe you ought to talk to Liberty University about that. I mean… Because I, I have people bring stuff to me all the time. I'm like, you can, you can disagree with me as you work for us anytime you want to disagree, but come and disagree with me. Come and disagree with one of our leaders. You don't need to be belligerent doing it. You need to be kind, and I'm serving you. I'm trying to keep your job. I'm trying to keep this place running. I'm trying to grow it and help people. This is what we're doing. So come in and disagree with me. There's a couple of things that can happen. One is you might be right. And it's some information that I didn't have or leadership didn't have, and they needed to change something, and they needed to work on it. Thank God someone like you brought it into the office, and we were able to work on it. The other possibility is you don't have all the information, and when I give it to you, you change your mind. Because we were actually operating in wisdom, and you just didn't have the whole picture. And the other possibility is, is that you're going to leave there and go, I still don't agree, but at least I was heard. And then you get to decide if you want to be part of the organization or not. We had some people quit our organization because we didn't do COVID like they thought we should do COVID. And by the way, it doesn't matter how you do COVID. Somebody's not going to like COVID, right? I mean, this is how this works. There's nobody's happy. Everybody's not happy. I mean, it, you know, but my friend Max Licato was in the office this week doing, doing the radio show, and he said, Dave, you know, he said, I was asking him how the stuff had been at his church, and he said, it's kind of wild. He said, a lot of people are angry. I said, yeah, there's a lot, nothing angrier than a scared person. And he said, you know, dogs don't bark at parked cars. Anytime you're doing something, you can expect somebody to be barking about it unresolved disagreements. Sit down with the people that you love. Sit down with the organization you care about. If you can't come to agreement, maybe that's God's sign your season there is over. That's okay. That's not evil. That's not bad. You cannot be, you cannot work for Ramsey and go to heaven. Who knew? <laughs> Number five is sanctioned incompetence. My friend John Maxwell coined this phrase in his book, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. You cannot sanction incompetence in an organization and have unity. Sanctioned incompetence, the psychologists would call it enabling. And in Christianity, we've got enabling down to an art form. We call it being nice. I don't want to confront your misbehavior or your underperformance or your lack of excellence or whatever the issue is in the name of being nice. I made this mistake big time as a young leader when I first started adding people to the team in my 20s. I thought I was being nice by holding my frustration in on their lack of excellence and never dealing with it until finally it would just boil up and I would just be done with it. And by then, I was done with them, and that was unfair to them. I finally figured it out, and I changed the whole thing in my head, and I changed it in all my leadership team head. We figured out to be unclear is to be unkind. Well, bless your heart. 
What does that mean? Does that mean you really want my heart to be blessed or are you getting ready to slip my throat? Because in the South, it can mean just about anything you want it to mean. You can put a cadence on it that means death. You can put a cadence on it that means pity. You can put a cadence, you know what I'm saying? And this is, what, this is being nice instead of being clear. To, to be gentle and kind and say, you know, I'm really disappointed in your performance on this. Well, what do you mean, Dave? I don't understand. Well, I mean, you didn't, this is what you said you were going to do, and you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Well, you're mean. No, I'm not mean. It's mean to not tell them. They don't have any opportunity to correct their performance then. They don't have any opportunity. If it's just your friend, and your friend starts running their mouth about you, they violate that other one. They're gossiping about you, and you come to them, and you say, you know, I'm disappointed, versus not saying anything at all. I'm disappointed. You know, when you gossip about me, I heard about it. It hurt me. That hurt. That's being clear. That's actually being kind, and that'll build your friendship. It'll build the quality of the organization. It'll build your marriage when you have these clear conversations. To be unclear in the name of nice is not Christian. It's enabling. To be unclear and allow someone to function in a way. See, we, we got a problem out there, world changers, and you guys are fixing it. By the way, I got a whole bunch of Liberty grads um, on our team. So I know this is true. Coming out of here, you are equipped to go into the marketplace and be excellent. Give this place a round of applause. It's incredible. Because there's a problem for an old guy like me. I remember parts of Christianity when Christians would try to go do something that the mainstream was trying to do, but didn't do it as well. And Christian in the marketplace meant substandard. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You can't do substandard. Around Ramsey, we don't sanction incompetence. Because if you're going to tell the world that you're a Christian organization, you got to be the best in the space. No mistakes. You got to go for the Super Bowl every play. If you're going to put a fish on the back of it, baby, you ought to drive it right. The diligent prosper. All diligence is, is excellence in the ordinary every day. Excellence. The way I perform, the way I go for it, the way I go, game on, baby, the way I do that is my witness. There's a whole lot of people in the universe that don't like Dave Ramsey, but there's one thing they know for sure is I'm always wide open. Whatever it is they don't like, I'm doing it wide open. Whatever it is they do like, I'm doing it wide open. This is going to be on my tombstone. Whatever it was, it was wide open, baby. We're going to bring it. Because I don't want people going, that's one of those Christians who mailed it in. And I don't want someone to have to sanction my poor performance. And their being nice is in the name of being Christian. Christian means excellence. The diligent prosper. Excellence in the ordinary on a daily basis changes everything. So I'm so excited to get to share this with y'all today. This is a, a lesson I share with business leaders when they come to our business conferences. I tell them to go back to their organization and fight against these five enemies of unity so that their organization can be a more fun place to come to work, a better quality set of human beings around there, the quality of the work goes up and the customer gets served. See, worship service, customer service, one's on Sunday and the other's on Monday. And they're the same thing if you're in the business marketplace and you're a believer. You better bring it. So I tell them, you know, fight against poor communication. Over communicate. Tell people more than they need to know. Make it awkward. Make sure the shared purpose is very clear with everyone in the organization. And if you're in an organization and you don't know what the shared purpose is, find out. They probably have one if it's a quality organization and they just have stepped on their toes and not communicated it yet. Find out. Because there are churches that are very evangelistic. 
There are churches that their praise and worship is their thing. There are churches, what is driving this move of God? It's usually one or two little things right there, and it's a shared purpose. Plug into that. Fight against gossip and don't participate in it. Dumping garbage on the internet is just like spray painting the side of a building. Don't do that. Be a builder. Be a giver, not a taker. Be a builder. Don't be one that tears them down. Fight against unresolved disagreements. It's awkward. Some people have a hard time doing conflict. Um, I, I don't. It makes me a great talk radio host, but um, it, it doesn't necessarily make me a great human So, because I, I can do conflict instantaneously. It doesn't bother me a bit, and I'm not ashamed of it at all. But, I, you know, there's other personality styles on the Enneagram or on the disc or whatever that, you know, they don't like conflict. But make conflict a part of your life to where just enough to where you say, I'm going to be clear because not being clear and being frustrated with this person and they don't even know it is not biblical. We're going to get on the same page. We're going to resolve our disagreements. And I'm not going to sanction a lack of excellence in my personal life, and I'm not going to sanction it in my organization. I'm going to call people out and say, you got to bring it. It's game on. We're going for it. you got to do these things. World changers, those are real tools that I've used to build our organization. Those are real tools that maybe not stated exactly that way, but have held this place together and grown this place and have caused my good friend Jonathan Falwell and his wife Sherry to be able to stand on top of all of this and lead you guys and serve you guys. Whether they're stated or not, these are the things that have caused you to be here. The spirit in this place, you can feel it when you come on this campus, represents unity. Go be a person that creates unity instead of disunity. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. God, I pray for these world changers. There's so much potential in this room that it is mind-blowing. I can sense that you are sitting on your throne smiling because you can see 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, what the untapped potential in this room will become when it becomes potential, when it, when it becomes what it's supposed to become. God, the, the people in this room, the things that they're going to do the lift that they're going to give to their own lives, to the lives of others, and to the kingdom of God is absolutely amazing. Protect them, Father. Provide for them. Give them the courage to be builders. Give them the courage to be givers, not takers. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you guys appreciate that great business life lesson that we received today from Dave Ramsey? I know Dave Bratt right over here, who is our dean of uh, School of Business. Like, I'm sure he was taking like a lot of notes because great stuff was given to us today. Hey, tonight, Campus Community, 7 o'clock, Clayton King is going to be speaking tonight. Make sure you come back and be a part of that. And then on Friday, Gary Hamrick, pastor of Cornerstone Chapel up in Leesburg, Virginia, will be here. God bless you. Hey, last week... Both of our convos went late. We are five minutes early, so there you go. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>